much, Matt Peter. It's very, very, you know, resonating with me personally also, but um, your positivity is beautifully contagious. <laughs> um, we have one more speaker before the round table, and I would like to welcome James Hewitt from, <laughs> sorry, from Hitsa Performance. That's right. Please give him a big hand. What a great series of presentations. We're going to shift gears slightly, and I'm going to share some ideas that hopefully will resonate with this at a personal level, maybe give us some, some practical tools. I've certainly got a lot to think about already. My name is James Hewitt. I'm a performance scientist. And this morning, I've got an important question for you. What is the key to sustainable human high performance? I've been obsessed with this question for quite a long time. Actually, it started about 15 years ago. I was a full-time racing cyclist, trying to make my career as a professional in the south of France. Unfortunately, my cycling career didn't quite reach the heights that I hoped. I returned to the UK, studied sports science. I set up my own coaching business. But most of the people that I worked with were actually amateur cyclists. They had very demanding jobs in London, later where I was based at the time. They were finance professionals and architects, but for some reason, Outside of those demanding working days, they also pursued very challenging cycling events. During this time, three important things happened. The first was that I became fascinated with their work. What was going on during their work day? Second, I started to apply tools and frameworks from sports science to try and understand that work day better. And finally, I had a revelation. Knowledge work is an endurance activity. And that revelation actually inspired a lot of my work and research today. I'm actually doing my PhD at the moment, looking at knowledge workers in particular, and their daily rhythms in stress, in sleep, and in cognitive performance. So, what is the key to sustainable high performance? Well, if you're among the 79% of people who were driven by dopamine to check their smartphone within 15 minutes of waking up this morning, I'm afraid you haven't found the key. If you're among the 42% who admit to using email in the bathroom, you haven't found it either. The average knowledge worker is interrupted once every 11 minutes. We check in on communication tools once every 6 minutes, and what do we do at the end of that demanding day to relax? We sit on the sofa, we watch TV, but we can't just watch TV anymore. We have to switch between the big screen, our smartphone, and our tablet computer, an average of 21 times per hour. We're never resting. We're rarely focused. We're always on. <clears throat> but we can't always be on. And that truth is particularly apparent in endurance sport. So I'm going to share some principles from endurance sport that I think apply equally well to the endurance activity of knowledge work. See, in endurance sport, we have to create plans for physical endurance. And one of the ways that we do that is to use a principle called intensity zones or training zones. Anyone who does a kind of endurance sport is probably familiar with that. Imagine a low, medium and high intensity zone. You see, the, the main principle, the main point of training or competing in endurance sport is you need to apply your effort in the right place at the right time so that you're not exhausted. And actually, there's three principles that I think we can learn from endurance sport that apply equally well to the endurance activity of knowledge work. The first is we can achieve better results for similar effort if we apply the effort in the right place at the right time. Secondly, we need to recover, even if we don't feel like it. Finally, perhaps most importantly, we need to find and follow our own rhythm, pay attention to when we are at our best. But effort in sport relatively easy to measure, isn't it? You've got power meters on bikes, heart rate monitors when you're running. In contrast, we rarely consider rhythms in cognitive performance and knowledge work, perhaps because it's a little bit more difficult to record. But whether you consider these rhythms or not, actually cognitive performance varies by about 20% during the average day. About 20% of us in this room will experience this variation as a peak, a valley, and a rebound. We might call ourselves early birds generally prefer mornings. Another 20% of the population experiences in reverse. They start with a rebound, have a valley in the middle, and then their peak comes later in the day, even into the evening. I call these people owls. They generally feel at their best in the evenings. 
Now about 60% of people fall somewhere in between. But whether you're an early bird, an owl, or in the middle, those three phases have distinct characteristics. That peak is the best time for focus, for analysis, and productivity. That rebound is a great opportunity for the menial tasks and the switching work, which characterises at least part of most knowledge workers' day. And that, re that valley in the middle, that is the best time for rest, recovery, and reflection. But most of us aren't paying attention to those rhythms. And it's likely that we're compromising our cognitive performance as a result. And as some people have alluded to in the presentations already, this is a problem. So I think human-centric cognitive capabilities are going to become an increasingly important differentiator in the future of work. Some studies suggest in most occupations, 30% of the work could already be automated. But as a human performance scientist, fascinated with that other 70%, the 70% that I'm convinced will be characterised by our most human capabilities. Capabilities that we actually saw on a previous slide, actually. Complex problem solving creativity and collaboration. But these capabilities will not emerge at their full potential with our current ways of living and working because they're the output, the output of a rested and focused brain. You know, the real danger, I don't think, is that artificial intelligence and robots are going to start working increasingly like humans and take all of our jobs. It's actually that we humans are going to try to keep working more like machines. You know, we can't always be on. Lots of people want to upgrade their brain. A study was published in Nature last year in 2017 that suggested that uh, the rates of people using cognitive performance enhancers increased in all the regions that have been studied. But you know, I think that the solution could be much more simple than relying on cognitive performance enhancement. It might actually simply be about more human rhythms of work and rest. Knowing where to focus effort, being clear about when to rest, finding and following our own rhythm, paying attention to when we are at our best. I decided to investigate this in a bit more detail as part of my research, and so recently I recruited 100 knowledge workers I tracked them for 14 days, and during that time, I looked in particular at their daily rhythms of sleep, of stress, and of cognitive performance. Now, on this graph, you can see some of those daily variations in cognitive performance and aggregate level. But I was interested to delve a bit deeper and see what was driving them, and in particular, we could see that adequate sleep and manageable stress were some of the most important drivers of cognitive performance. But the message is quite simple. People who follow rhythms of work and rest feel better and perform better. If you're too stressed and you're sleep deprived, it's unlikely that you're performing sustainably. What a surprise. Do you know that after working for 18 hours straight, that's equivalent from working from 8 a.m. in the morning to 2 a.m. the next day, your cognitive performance is equivalent to being legally drunk in most European countries. <laughs> Inadequate sleep may be costing Nordic economies 80 billion euros per year. Work-related stress is estimated to cost the European economy 136 billion euros. And it may be responsible for one-fifth of staff turnover. We can't always be on. Now, are you aware of your rhythms? Do you work with your rhythms? Do you work against your rhythms? Do you, you ignore them completely? Whatever the case, I think that we benefit from having a plan of cognitive endurance. So inspired by that plan for physical endurance that I used with endurance athletes, those three intensity zones, I created a plan for cognitive endurance that I call cognitive gears. So I'd like to imagine for a moment there is a low cognitive gear that's characterised by those times of rest, recovery and reflection. There's a high cognitive gear characterised by those times of focus, analysis and productivity. And then there's a medium cognitive gear that's characterised by the menial tasks and the switching work, which makes up at least part of most of our day. But if you think for a moment about your average day in the context of those three cognitive gears, how do you spend your time? Yeah, the majority of us find that we spend most of our day stuck 
in a cognitive middle gear. A middle gear that's characterised by being caught in pseudo work and switching, feeling stressed and on someone else's schedule. So what can we do? Well, I think it begins by committing to make one small positive change and maybe start with an experiment. This could be at an individual level. Perhaps more powerfully, it could be at a corporate or organisational level. But whatever the case, as you approach the finish line today, I'm going to share some practical ideas so that you can take some of this theory and put it into action. The first ideas are for that high cognitive gear. You pay attention to when you are at your best and begin by scheduling that high cognitive gear work with the peak in your day. Secondly, during that time, experiment with something like the Pomodoro technique, working 25 minutes on and five minutes off, instead of checking your communication tool once every six minutes. And as individuals, but perhaps more importantly as leaders, we need to create and engineer environments for focus for ourselves, but also for our teams. What about that low cognitive gear? When to take a rest? We'll begin by scheduling rest, because few of us do that, if we're honest. And schedule that rest to coincide with the valley in your day. According to quite a lot of evidence, the most effective breaks are active, social and natural. Go for a walk with someone that you like. In London, it used to be called a lunch break before it went extinct. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, perhaps most importantly, sleep seven to nine hours per night. If you're a leader, try and engineer and create an environment where your team can sleep seven to nine hours per night because sleep is one of the most effective performance enhancers that we have available. For that medium cognitive gear, well, begin by setting some boundaries around those inevitable switching tasks and try to synchronize those switching tasks and the middle gear work with the rebound in your day. And finally, perhaps most importantly, whether you're a lark, an early bird, an owl who prefers evenings, or somewhere in between, try to start the day, at least those first few minutes on your schedule. Pay attention to when, at your rhythm, when you feel at your best. Adequate sleep and manageable stress, according to some evidence, appears to be able to improve cognitive performance by 10 to 15%. Improving employee well-being may be able to enhance productivity by 19%. If individuals who slept under six hours achieved adequate sleep, it could be worth 13 billion euros to the Nordic economy. And the effect on the individual could be great. Real focus, reduced stress, enhanced recovery. So what is the key? The key to sustainable high performance? Well, I actually think that there are three. The first is to be clear about where to focus effort. The second is to be disciplined and know when and where to rest. And finally, perhaps most importantly, find and follow your own rhythm. Pay attention to when you are at your best. Because knowledge work is an endurance activity. Thank you. So that was more of a sprint no. than an endurance activity, but we've got time for a few questions over the next couple of minutes. I think you had your hand up first, so. Oh, cool. um, I'm Lena. Thanks for the presentation. It's very insightful. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is about night owls. Uh, I believe that our society is made for uh, maybe the early birds. So what do you do as a night owl? Yeah, so it's a great question. And I think. I think our society is often set up for early birds. We uh, often um, conflate uh, starting early with industriousness and lots of positive qualities. I think this is a question that we need to explore in the context of maybe permitting more flexible working. I think certainly it needs to be explored in terms of um, uh, in our education system, potentially starting the day later. But then we also need to consider the impact of that on parents who need to drop kids off at school before they go to work, uh, which is also a challenge. But what often I encourage people to do is, if they can during their holiday, try and do an N equals one experiment to find out what their rhythm really is. Because sometimes people think they're night owls because actually they're sleeping inadequately and it takes them until the end of the day to start to wake up properly. Um, so um, I think it's a complex question that needs to be addressed and I think practically the best thing that you can do is start to work with your team 
um, to maybe do some experiments and try and measure the results to see whether a more flexible pattern that works in line with people's rhythms could improve people's well-being and performance. Yeah, so I think um, we have another question here. That someone was really quick fire with that, put their hand up. So do you want to go for it? Me? Yeah. Okay, it's similar to the question she made. And do you think there is another way that business can can do like to consider the employee's rhythm besides the flexible work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, flexible work is obviously an obvious solution to it, but um, I think potentially another way to address it is um, by um, allowing people to structure their day, to actually schedule rest periods in the day, and to try and challenge some of these notions of presenteeism that we see in some knowledge work environments where um, you're being produ productive when you're sitting at your computer, um, and actually you know, allow people to take a proper lunch break. Um, now, in the Nordic countries, particularly Finland, I know that's quite um, common, um, and it really surprised me. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I live in France at the moment, I work in Switzerland, originally from the UK, and I couldn't believe it when everyone left the office and went for lunch. I was like, <laughs> like How do you, you're slacking, you know. But actually, um, there's some evidence to suggest that um, the productivity gains following a break can actually more than compensate for the time off in the break. Um, and so I think that we need to start to challenge, in some contexts, in some cultures, some of those um, uh, preconceived notions uh, around work and rest. <coughs> Maybe you've got time for one more question? Or? Yeah. Okay, one more question. So. It always works. Uh, it's more of a technical question. In your studies, how do you uh, measure cognitive performance? So, um, so I use a couple of techniques. In that study that I mentioned, um, people were using a smartphone-based measure of cognitive performance, which was originally developed for use by the US military, and I'm measuring kind of um, uh, fundamental cognitive capabilities. So I got people to do it twice a day for two weeks. Um, but that data was time locked with other things like sleep and self-report measures of stress. Uh, but I also use EEG, um, electroencephalogram, which uses, measures the electrical activity of the brain to measure things like cognitive load during particular tasks. Um, and so um, I've got a number of tools in the toolbox. But yeah, I like that question. It's good. No more questions. Uh, I'm afraid uh, we've got to move on. I've uh, taken enough of your time. But thank you. I'll be around for the rest of the day.